<laughs> is there anything, I don't know if anybody here who reads newspapers or even electronic newspapers. That's, that's what I'm, okay, some people say they do. Anybody see anything in the news about genomics or anything like that? I always like to bring up uh, if there's any topics in the news that are related to uh, something we might be doing here. And it, yes? Okay, so usually what happens is what there several, you know, it's quite often these days new organisms get sequenced. And so the question, she's saying that she's heard about the Tasmanian devil getting sequenced. Okay, and what is the Tasmanian devil? It's a marsupial, it's a, I guess a small, mean little thing, I gather, um, in Australia that has a um, particular horrible problem, which is that it's got a the population is in grave danger because of a virus that gives a kind of cancer. And people are trying to figure out how this works. So one Tasmanian devil bites the other one, and the new one gets the disease, and they get cancer. It's a big problem. And so one of the approaches to try to understand how th this works and how cancer works is by sequencing the genome. Once you sequence the genome, you learn a lot about what, what genes are there, what makes the Tasmanian devil different than anything else. Why might it be susceptible to this kind of thing? Why might people be susceptible to something like this? So we, why is there not a virus like this that is affecting people? Or maybe there is. These are the kind of things you might start to study and learn when you, uh, you know, when, once you sequence genomes and do these kinds of studies. Presumably one difference is we don't bite the face of each other as regularly as the Tampanian devil does. So that's one, maybe one issue. But any questions? Okay. I mean, there was another, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, you want to get that? Don't ask me that question yet. I'm still on a roll with the preliminaries. Um, the uh, there's also something in the news. I don't know how people saw about that they'd sequenced the genome of the plant that that uh, gives chocolate, the cocoa plant. I don't know if people have seen that. It's actually kind of interesting that uh, actually two separate groups basically independently sequenced two different types of cocoa plants recently. So now they know, in principle, all the genes that are associated with the plant that was responsible for making chocolate. And why would they do something like that? You'd like to be able to know. Maybe you'd like to make, you know, increase the cocoa butter content of chocolate or something like that. You need to know what genes are involved. What's this cocoa plant like? Where did it evolve from? There's lots of things you might learn from that. There's enough interest in something like that that two separate groups did this independently. Okay, sort of in competition with each other. Okay, one was sponsored by the Department of Agriculture and the other by basically, you know, um, you know to, and the other I think by a candy company. Okay, because they wanted to assure themselves good supply and uh, improve chocolate. Any questions? So sequencing is an important thing and that's the kind of thing you see in the news sometimes. Okay, now let's get serious now about um, assembly. We've been talking about se genome assembly in here. Last class, we talked about the technology that you should now believe that uh, if you want to sequence a genome, be it a cancer genome or a, a particular, you know, a, a the Tasmanian devil or cocoa or anything like that, you get lots of, of samples length about 500. You sequence them, okay, and you try to put them together. That is what genome sequencing is. Now, why is assembly a hard problem? The first problem I've said several times is that the most natural notion of assembly is to order them so you get the shortest string containing all the fragments. Okay? Why the shortest? Well, there's somehow the most mutual support for seeing things again. There's somehow there's a philosophical Occam's razor idea that the shortest explanation of the data is presumably the best one. And so if you've got enough reads, the shortest common superstring should do it. Trouble is, finding the shortest common superstring of the fragments is NP complete. Okay? So that's one problem with assembly. But that's not the major problem. Okay. Any questions? Okay? What makes it harder, of course, is it's not exactly shortest common superstring. Because there are sequencing errors. Remember, we talked in class that, uh, you know, that you've got, um, what you call it, a sequencing error rate of about 2%. So if this is a read of length 500, if there's a sequencing error of about 2%, we would expect about 10 places in there where we wrote, wrote, got the wrong letter. 
We got a C when there was a G. Okay? Now, if we look for the shortest common superstring, note that, that in the aligned fragment down here, there is not going to be that error there. Does that make sense? If this error is, you know, something happened there, uh, it's unlikely that error is going to be repeated. And so we're not looking for the shortest common superstring. We are looking for the shortest common superstring with a modest amount of errors in that we have to correct. Does that make sense? That we've got to deal with this complexity. Okay? And that it changes the problem somewhat. Okay? Any questions? Okay? The fact that the original version is hard means that this problem is as hard or harder. Okay? But that's what they do. Unless we, they, they will guarantee us no errors, we won't have to worry about it. Okay? But that's not yet why the problem is really, really hard. Okay? A bigger problem has to do with the nature of the strings that you want to sequence. Suppose, let's say, we had a really random string. Suppose your DNA was a really a random string. You know, the creator went through and, you know, flipped a, flipped a, a coin, every, a, a dice, a four-sided dice, to make up your genome every time. And so the bases were... Um, you know, independent at random and stuff like that, right? Then it turns out that actually random genome sequences would be easy to reconstruct relatively. Why is that? Because long copies of patterns are unlikely to repeat by chance. Does it kind of make sense that if I flip a coin and it comes up, starts out head, tail, 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 head, and I go, you know, 50 bases long. It's very unlikely that, you know, in a the next million or billion flips, I'm going to get that exact pattern of 50 bases again. Does everybody see that? So in a random string, you would expect there's not that many long repetitions. I'll probably talk about that a little bit more. But we can probably start to understand that repetitions you know, happen randomly, you would understand that there's not going to be very long repetitions. Okay? Unfortunately, or, you know, the way genomes evolved, there are a lot of repetitions. What happened? Here was a species. From time to time, there was a, um, you know, there's some events, you know, like the, you know let's say a vir some viruses that change genome sequences that cause repetitions. Remember I talked about how the number of repetitions could be used to identify a blood sample? Well, these repetitions would not have occurred in a random sequence, but there is some biological process by which these repeats happen, bop, 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 or a, a copying error or something like that. There's also the cases where genes themselves tend to copy or duplicate. There are these evolutionary duplication events. And sometimes the same gene or the same sequence will occur many, many times in the genome. Okay? And these repeats make it very, very hard to assemble things. Does that make sense? Why is it? Because you're now asking. Here we've got this gene is pretty much similar to that gene. If I've got that read here and this read here, it is likely that they overlap by a lot. Does that kind of make sense? Because this sequence over here is almost identical to this sequence over here. So one of the things that makes assembly really, really hard is dealing with these repeat problems. Okay? Any questions about that? Does it seem plausible why repeats make it harder? Okay? Any questions? Okay? So this is a big problem. In fact, one of the things about repeats is that actually the shortest common superstring is typically shorter than the real genome. Why is that? Because suppose, let's say, your reads are of length 500. And somewhere in the middle, there is a string of 1,000 AT, 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 ATs, right? There is no read that is going to get, any read in this region is just going to get a pattern of ATs, right? You have no way of knowing it's 1,000 long. Your longest thing that spans it is 500. The shortest string is going to be, you know, common superstring would only have 500 ATs there. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So we got to deal with it. And unfortunately, the AT, AT, AT part is not that interesting. It's the other parts that are more interesting. Okay? But we got to deal with repeats. Any questions? Okay, yes? Well, if the question is, is the shortest common superstring ever longer than the, um, than the uh, what you call it, the original one? The answer should be no. If you, and if, if you assume the reads are all taken without error, the answer is going to have to be no. Why is that? The genome itself is a superstring of all the reads. Does everybody agree with that? Because every read is part of it. If you're telling me here are so, a bunch of reads, now put them together and it is longer than the genome, I'll say, hey, wait a second, the genome is shorter than that and it contains it. Okay? Now, it's possible that with sequencing error, you might, you might uncover that problem. But the problem, the danger here is more one of making it too short than making it too long. Okay? Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Any other questions about this? Yes? Ah, okay, so you may be asking something else. The question I say is there a danger of getting a longer sequence? Now, what you're saying is the following is true. Because finding the shortest common superstring, the absolute shortest common superstring, is NP complete, we're certainly going to give up on the idea of trying to do that, right? So you're right that we're going to be doing a heuristic. And our heuristic might very well be the greedy one we talked about, right? Where we just sort of align the biggest pairs. And there is indeed no guarantee that the thing that we get here won't be bigger than, than, the, than the actual genome, right? And so I guess in that sense you may be right, okay? If we found the real right shortest common superstring, it would be shorter than the genome. Given that we're finding what we can find, okay, it might be longer. Theoretically, you can prove that, essentially prove, that it won't be more than um, twice as long as the, 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 the one in the wild. But even that's only on a pathological example. In fact, I would say there's, you know, the length is about right of assemblies in practice, because assembly algorithms are pretty good, except in the repeat regions, where it gets really hard. Okay? Question. Even if it's, it's not a question, it's like, even if it's longer, we, um, before we actually sequence the genome, we actually know the length of the genome. Okay, so you're saying, wait a second, we would know that we, we could measure the length of the molecule, and therefore, if we got a, an assembly that was much longer than that, we would know we did something wrong. That's probably true, except for a couple things. First of all, as you're measuring the, the, uh, the um, molecule length roughly, so it's not going to be the case that you get an answer that it's 3,169,073 bases. Okay? You're going to get a rough measurement. Oh, it's about 3 billion. Okay? And um, so, that's, that, that would, so, so that may or may not you know, give you an accurate measure of it. Okay? In general, the way to think about it is, except for the repeats, I think that the, in, in practice with these assemblies, there are the non-repeat areas which you feel very confident about, and there are the repeat areas which give you headaches, okay? And, you know, of course, you want to do as well as you can with them, but I would say that in general, that's roughly the way an assembly works, okay? Any questions? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, in a real assembly, does the order of the genes matter? Okay, the answer is, in a, if you think about it, an assembly experiment, an, a, an assembly job is a biology experiment, right? You want to learn as much as you can about that underlying system. And so, in the absolute best possible worlds, you would get the absolute perfect, complete sequence. Okay, the real question now goes, if you are a cocoa company that has decided to sequence the cocoa genome, how much money are you willing to spend on perfection? And the answer is, you know, there's progressively higher standards of knowledge that you could get by doing more and more sequencing and investing more in a coverage and more in assembly. On the other hand, the, the, 
at some point, the extra accuracy is not worth the extra cost. That's the way I would put it. So yes, you would, turns out you would like to know the order of the genes, okay, on the sequence. That sometimes has a lot of interest, okay? But sometimes, because of gaps, maybe you won't have a complete knowledge, okay? You do the best that you can. As a computer scientist doing the assembly, my job is to take your data and do the best that I can putting it together, okay? As a biologist, your job is to do the, try to write, get as big a grant as you can to buy as much data <laughs> for me to assemble. Yes? So the question is, what is the accuracy of the stuff in GenBank? The answer is you are not sure of the accuracy of anything in GenBank, anything more than you're sure of the accuracy of anything on the Internet. Okay? What you hope is that the biologist didn't just make this thing up and randomly type it in. You're hoping that they did the best job that they could, okay, which presumably is the case. And, you know, you use the best data that you can. If you need better data than the best data that's in GenBank, well, you write a proposal and you, you try to generate it, okay? The goal is to basically produce as useful, much useful data as you can for the dollar, and there's sort of an optimization problem here that kind of, you know, it should make sense to you. You know, you can always spend more on perfection, but it gets a lot harder to guarantee no errors, okay? It may very well be, be impossible. You can probably always spend more money and make it more accurate. But the question is where, you know, under, under realistic constraints, what's the best you can do? Any questions? So all this is about why uh, assembly is hard. But it leaves out what is really the hardest part, okay? Or the part, which is the part we're going to talk about, is how big the problem is computationally. So I told you, okay, the problem's NP-complete. We're not going to deal with that. But... The problem of doing a genome assembly, you know, especially for a mammal, let's say, is a very, very big problem. When Solera sequenced the human genome, okay, which was the first one, they had roughly 26 million reads, okay? So they got about as input 26 million 500, each one of which was on average about 550 bases long. So if we think about it, the first step in doing the greedy algorithm is what? You've got to take every one of these 26 million fragments and compare them to every one of the other 26 million fragments and figure out how much do they overlap. Does that make sense? That's what the greedy algorithm does. So the first step, what is the number of computations you would do? Okay, as a gross guess, it is going to be quadratic in the number of reads. If each read is of length, you know, n, little n, to tell whether or not how much they overlap, it's probably something like this match count algorithm for all possible shifts, at least the initial logical way to do it. You want to figure out if this is going to overlap the other one by t positions. You've basically got to try what's the overlap when I shift it at t spots. And the only way that I could do that is first I do it at 1, two, three, four, five, six, and see where the best match is. Does everybody see that? There's n possible ending positions, n possible characters to compare along the way. I would argue that if you're doing this in a straightforward way, to compare a pair of reads is basically quadratic in the length of the reads. Okay? And that would mean that it's something like 26 million squared times 500 squared which, if you counted that, was about 10 to the 20th operations, okay? So at the time that Solera was doing the assembly, they had like the second biggest computer installation in the world, okay? But even so, it took them over 20,000 CPU hours to do this assembly of the human genome, okay? Just to do these kind of comparisons, okay? Any questions about that? Now, for them to get it down to 20,000 CPU hours, they had to use sophisticated algorithmics. If you look at 10 to the 20th operations, that is ridiculous. That cannot be done on any number of computers in the world. Okay, certainly not any number of the computers in the world back then. Okay? Any questions about that? So what I'd like to say, convince you now, is that really what the critical computational issue in <coughs> sequence assembly 
is taking a huge number of reads and figuring out which pairs overlap each other. Okay? Once you know which pairs overlap each other, you get the biggest pairs that overlap each other. Those probably stick together. It's clear you're a long way, to, the way towards doing this greedy algorithm. Does that make sense? Okay? Any questions about that? So what I'd like to now stress for the rest of the class is to talk a little bit about how we can do sequence comparisons. Okay, now I'm not sequence, you know, basically do this sequence matching to decide what, see, which of these reads overlap which other reads more efficiently than this big n squared, little n squared algorithm. Any questions? Okay. Because this is really the core of what is necessary to be done on assembly. Any questions? Okay. So now I'd like to talk, unless, there, unless there's any other questions, I'd like to now start talking about data structures for strings. Oh, before we get in, one last um, issue. Recognize that we all have to deal with these sequencing errors, okay? And that we should probably think a little bit about what that means, okay? Now, if I'm going to be over detecting the overlap of two strings with sequencing errors, okay? This means that exact matches start to be potentially hard to come. Let's say that these two sequences, in principle, this fragment and this fragment should overlap in about 200 bases. Okay? Suppose that each read has about a 2% sequencing error. How many mismatches would we expect in this region of overlap? Okay? So let's say there are two pieces of DNA that, that in fact do come from the same place. They, op they should overlap by 200 bases, right? Do we, does this mean that we look for a 200 mer at the end of this that matches the 200 mer at the beginning of this? I would say no, because there's probably some sequencing errors. How many sequencing errors would we expect in this window? Eight. I heard eight. I heard four. How many would I expect? Well, in this read, I would expect that there's 200 bases. 2% 2 sequencing errors means that in each 100 bases, I would expect two. So I probably expect four errors there. I probably expect four errors here, which almost certainly are in different positions. Does everybody agree with that? So if I'm looking for an exact match, how long an exact match might I expect to find? Okay? The, the techniques that I'm going to talk about in here are really going to be about finding exact matches of strings. And you may get queasy saying, oh, what about sequencing errors? Okay? In this case, these two strings overlap by 200. They have eight errors. Is it an exact matching problem or not? Okay? And the answer is, how big a hunk of exact matching can we expect to have if we have 200 bases, each of with, with eight errors in them? Okay? Something like this. I mean, again, it should be something like this. If we have something of length 200, if we want to figure out what's, how do we have the smallest number of exact matches, length of exact matches, we probably put these eight errors equally spaced, right? And I guess you wouldn't want them at the beginning of the end, right? So if they were all equally spaced, that would be what? Okay? That would be 20. Am I right about that? I guess that would be 25, I think. If they were eight, cut into eight hunks, divided, 200 divided by eight was 25, I believe, right? But again, you also have to worry about the end. Maybe one more, maybe two more. The argument here is that with, even with this error, no matter how you space the errors, you would expect there to be exact matches of length sentence 19, 20, something in this range, right? So the key thing that we're going to be looking for, ultimately, are long exact matches between pairs of segments, okay? And we know that even if we have a lot of sequencing errors, and even if those sequencing errors were put in an adversarial way, we would still expect reasonably long exact matches in common. Any questions? Okay. Yes. Yeah, when these two fragments, uh, which are not, which are say, 
have say four errors. Yeah. And then we have to reconstruct a uh, fragment from these two two things. So which uh, which value would we take? Would we uh, take okay. So the question uh, is the now that the question really is okay. Fine. You can find your um. You know, I can I can decide that these two overlap each other. Okay. And I can now see that you, I've got an assembly. Here is my assembly. Ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. These are riddled with errors. Let me add a few more pieces in here just to make it right. What is the sequence that I would report? Okay. It should be clear that, it, uh, that if I have two sequences that overlap and there is a sequencing error, I don't know which of the two it is, right? But remember, what is the coverage that I need to sequence a mammalian genome? Remember we talked about the coverage last time? We talked that to use gaps, I had to sequence the genome in some sense many times. If I had a coverage of 10, which is what you would use in a bacterial genome typically, let's say under this, then on average I've got about 10 different layers at any given point, right? Now then, how would I figure out what the right base is? If these errors are independent, I've got 10 votes, right? And now if nine of them come up C and one of them come up A, you're getting a C, right? <laughs> and the problem is really, you know, sort of if I've got enough coverage, I can vote, and that's probably a good way to tell. Does that make sense? Turn out there's other ways to tell. These sequencing machines will also tell you uh, how confident they are in a letter. Okay, so you might go back and to look at, you know, when 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 it looks at one of these reads, you get a score as to how how accurate would did it think this base was. And if you saw that, gee, there's five that say A's and five that say C's, but the ones that say A's, four of them are unreliable and the C's look more confident, maybe we'll give it to the C's. Everybody see that? So in principle you can see how we can correct sequencing errors. I think that much should be clear. Okay? So we can correct for them and the important thing is that uh, they're not going to doom anything I say about overlap detection because we're still looking for long exact matches. That's really the, 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 the critical thing that we're going to be doing with these data structures. Any questions? Yes. So, uh, the okay, what you are uh, saying that same sequences might overlap at many positions. What do you mean exactly? The couple things you might mean by that. One possibility might be that you have the same strings that could overlap at many positions. So, for example, let's say that this hunk of the sequence was all A's. And this hunk of sequence was all A's. Does everybody see that? Then in some sense I could slide them any place along the way I can slide these guys. I don't have any mismatches, right? Did they overlap in this many places or that many places? Okay? That is, I guess, a problem. It's really a problem only though if I'm looking for a long match if the string is relatively uninteresting at that point. It's going to be hard to have too many different alignments where the thing matches a lot in a lot of different positions unless it's what we call a low period string. All A's, A T, A T, A T, A T, something like that. Okay? And these this might happen, but it's the relatively uninteresting part. Okay? So we'll have to deal with it. The bigger problem that you might have been saying though was, what if I have the same sequence on the genome here as here, then I've got to decide, does this overlap that? This is that problem of repeats that we talked about. And that's why repeats are a hard thing. Okay? And so we're going to have to invest some engineering effort to try to deal with that. Okay? But ultimately what I'd like to say for now, our critical problem is how do we compare, find all pairs of sequences which overlap by enough to be interesting. At which point we can now start to use special ad hoc methods to say, oh, what, given all these things a lab, how should they align and stuff like that. Any questions?
the gross question of grouping reads by which ones overlap which other ones by enough to be interesting is the computationally hard part. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? Okay. So now let's talk about um, algorithm, algorithms and data structures for matching strings. Okay? And so this is going to get into, you know, some good old computer science, okay, which we maybe haven't had that much of so far. And um, in particular, we're going to talk about a couple of structures for strings data, text string data, that are very, very useful. Okay, they're useful in biology, they're useful in anything that in, they're, they're useful in, um, you know, search engines, and useful in anything that involves strings. Okay? So... The data structure that I'm going to talk about first is a simple data called a try. Data structure called a try, T R I E. Okay, and why do they call it a try? Well, it looks a little bit like a tree. Okay, but it isn't. Okay, and it's supposed to be cute. It's supposed to be in the middle words of retrieval. If you spell retrieval right, you get it. The internal thing is a try. Okay, so that's where the name comes from. But what it is, is it's a data structure which is going to permit me, if I give you a string, all this data structure is going to talk, we talk about data structures first for dealing with the problem of managing a dictionary. What is a dictionary? A dictionary is a collection of words, okay? So suppose, let's say, I mean, you know, you're used to a dictionary, you look it up, right? There are 100,000 different words in English, okay? And you could imagine wanting to build a data structure that stored all 100,000 distinct words in English, okay? Maybe let's say you're building a spelling checker, right? Somebody now comes up with a word. You know, they say the word catch. Is catch properly spelled? Well, somewhere, if somewhere in this list of 100,000 words is the word C-A-T-H, catch is properly spelled right? On the other hand, if you look at a string like S-K-I-E-N-A, which is my last name, you won't find that in any dictionary of 100,000 words, right? And so this would come back as misspelled. So everybody see that if you wanted to build a spelling checking program, at heart of a spelling checking program is a data structure that takes as input a large number of words, your dictionary, and stores them in a way so that you can quickly retrieve, here is a new word, tell me if it's in the dictionary. Okay? Any questions? Especially for my non-CS people. I want to make sure people are with me here. Okay? Why you would want to do this. Okay? So we want a data structure that will take as input a set of words and organize them so that you can quickly get, you can give it a query string and find out whether it's one of those words, right? That's what a dictionary is. So let's say that we are given n words, each of which is about length s in length, okay? English words have a typical length, right? What's the longest word anybody knows in English? Supercalifragilistic, expialidocious. Okay, so, uh, uh, okay, anti-disestablishmentarianism, it's 20, 30, right? It's not a zillion. Does everybody agree with that? So what is the problem of maintaining an English dictionary? S is probably about 30, right? And um, the N is about 100,000, okay? Depends upon how big a dictionary it is or is not, okay? Now, how, what kind of techniques might you use? to solve this dictionary problem. Suppose you want to build a data structure to store these words in your dictionary so that you can quickly answer back for a query string what the answer is. Um, what kind of a data structure might you build? Those of you, okay, I'll take proposals here. Binary tree. I heard binary tree, okay. A bi what is a binary tree? Let's look at candidates here. What is a binary tree? A binary tree was a data structure where basically at each node in the tree we had a string, right? 
So the root of the tree might very well be mom. Okay, that's a word from the middle of English. If you, if you sort the 100,000 words in the English, you pick one of them at random. In the middle, roughly in the middle, it, mom is roughly in the middle, right? And you organize in a binary search tree. You would organize it so that anything alphabetically less than mom was on the left side, and everything alphabetically greater than mom was on the right side, right? And if you were building a binary search tree, maybe you would build it just sort of, you, 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 you take the words as they're given, you insert them into the tree. What should happen if you have a binary search tree? Any questions about how a binary search tree works? A good question would be, I don't know what you mean by a binary search tree. Any questions? Okay. What would be the performance of a binary search tree for this dictionary problem? Okay. What? I'm hearing log n. You're saying, well, you know, one of the best ways of building this, the binary search tree, the height should be about log n. Okay. And each comparison you're going to do at each step, I claim is you're going to take your query string, Skeena, and compare it to mom, right? Is Skeena the same as mom? If so, you found, you know, you found me in the dictionary. If not, um, am I greater than that? I claim any comparison of one string against another, in principle, should take the length of the string. Okay, you might get lucky. Oh, Skeena, S, okay, is ahead of mom. You know, if you look at it, S, okay, M, S, we could help them the first character. But in general, you might take time proportional to the whole string. Does everybody agree with that? Or maybe half the string. Maybe if you're really unlucky, every word in the, you have a dictionary for a language and every word in the dictionary begins with 600 A's, okay? Then you would have to match, 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 match a long way, right? So in general, I claim that if you used a binary search tree, it would take what? N, it would take the order log N times the length of the string or S. Does everybody get that? Okay, it's not a bad thing, but that's, that's that. Any other ideas for how you might arrange a dictionary? Yes? You could have a tree with alphabets. That's what I mean by a try, okay? So I think, I think that that's what we're going to be talking about. But any other ideas, just to double check before you? Yeah. If you have a fixed number of words, which I think we said, right? You yeah. Could, um, organize all the words according to the, for the, I guess, the first letters of each and store them um, in uh, sets of, like, memory uh, that are... Okay, you, what you guys are now hitting at is... Okay, so what I want to uh, are on ideas like a try. So I think I'm going to get going with that, okay? It should be clear that a binary search or a binary search tree, I would probably give it a choice here. Just sort the keys and, put, and do binary search on them rather than building a real binary search tree, okay? Because you have to maintain pointers and all that kind of stuff. The performance would look something like that. Instead, let's look at... Um, a another approach. And this is a try. Let's say that I'm going to represent a, um, a set of words by a um, basically something that looks like a tree, but where each node represents in some sense a character. Okay? Actually, each, let's say each, each edge represents a character, okay? And we're going to break our strings down. So each of the input strings is a path down the tree. So what is this tree? I don't know if you can read Let me zoom it up. Let's see if I can make it so you can read it back. Boom. Boom. Can I zoom it? Or no? Boom. Zoom. Zoom. Okay? Oops. Here is a try of a bunch of English words. What are this try? If you look at this word, what words are in my dictionary? Suppose it was T-H-E-I-R, there, right? What are the words that we have in this dictionary? There, 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 
What are the ones? Was and when. Does everybody see that? The also here. Okay, if you look at this thing, I'm going to color a node black if it represents the end of a word. Right? Sometimes there's words that are contained in other words, like the is contained in there. Right? So what is interesting about this particular tr data structure, this try? Okay? Yeah? This will as be a part of the word as in? As is not part of this word. Okay? That's an interesting thing. As is not in this dictionary. Why is it? The we're going to say basically, for the, it's basically going to be defined of how we search it. Every word that's going to be in the dictionary, we're going to insert it as a path of nodes starting from the root. Okay? If it has a prefix that matches something that was already in the dictionary, that's shared. We didn't have to make any other nodes, right? But ultimately, each, ro each uh, um, node that is, we color represents the end of a word. Yeah. So essentially, it would be 26 paths from the root? So essentially, at a 26 paths from the root, what you're saying is that to really represent this root node, one representation would be that it's a node with 26 pointers out of it, right? This is the A pointer. That's the Z pointer, right? And so we're going to represent each node by this. And in this particular case, all these pointers are going to be nil, with the exception of the T branch. That's going to go to something. And the W branch, that's going to go to something. Does everybody see that? So that's how we could represent each node. It's probably some, I could also alternately represent it as a linked list of pointers or something like that. But basically, this is what each node is going to be. It's an array of 20, let's say it's an array of 20, uh, 26 pointers. That's a reasonable way to do it. Any questions? Yes? So the T, the T branch in the root, yeah. point to another node which is Right, so every one of these nodes is one of these things, okay? So this thing is really a node like that, and that's a node like that. We maybe also want to have another field here for the color, which is either going to be white or, in this case, black. Basically, does it represent the, uh, one other bit to say, is it the end of a word or is it not the end of a word, right? And we can now vision building a tree structure like this. Does everybody see that? So what's interesting about this try? Any questions about what the try is? Especially, again, if you're not a CS person, a question like, what is a try? What is a node? What is any of these things? I'd like to hear answers for questions. Questions, OK? So how would we search for whether a word is in the dictionary? OK, what would be the algorithm to search for whether word is in the dictionary, if I represent it by a try. What do we do? We say your new word, you want to now know if they is in the dictionary. What do we do? We start from the root and say, my first word is letter is a T. Is there a T branch going out? Yes, there is. And so I go to another node. The next character is an H. Is there an H branch? Yes, there is. Is there an E branch? Yes, there is. Is there a Y branch? Uh, there is not, right? And we get a go up a nil pointer. We didn't find that we fell off the string. Does everybody see that? In general, we wait. Go to the if we can go to the end of the string, and we then are ending up on a colored node. That means that we had a string in here. Okay. Any questions about that? So that is a try, and that is a good way to represent a string. How fast does this now take to search whether a particular string of length s is in the dictionary? Exact length of the string, it's s. Does everybody see this? Before we were doing this binary search thing, we paid a log n cost for it, right? So before we had something that was order s times log n, here we have one that is order s. Okay? So this one is much better. In fact, this has the amazing property, if you look at it, that 
time it takes to search is independent of the size of the dictionary. The time it takes to search, you know, your little children's dictionary is no more different than the time it takes to search the Oxford English Dictionary, right? It's independent of how many words it's on there. It's just proportional to the length of what you want to match. That's why the try is a very good data structure. Any questions about that? So yes. In, uh, for if we want to represent the human genomes then with this try, and this has to be stored in a memory, right? Okay. So what you're saying is, what if I want to represent the human genome with this? Okay. Well, first note that the try right now is a, is for a collection of words, right? So it doesn't really make sense to represent the human genome, but it does make sense to think about maybe representing all the reads that I got, right? I did a sequencing ex experiment. I've got a large number of reads. Maybe I might want to pop them into a try. And what you're noticing is what? That you're saying, oh, but if I want this to be fast, it's got to all fit in memory, right? So if your memory is limited, suddenly this uh, independence on the size of the dictionary sort of you know, goes away, okay? But in principle, okay, if you've got enough memory, this is going to be linear in the size of the string to search. Any questions? Okay? We are going to be talking about space savings a little bit later. Okay, so space is an important thing. Okay? And, but um, we'll deal with this a little later. Any questions? Yes? What if I get the length of the string first? Well, it turns out I don't really need to know the length of this thing in advance to search in it. I, it doesn't matter. I mean, if I want to find the length of this string, okay, that doesn't really help me. That tells me when I will be done, right? But basically, I'm just going to keep marching down my string until I have a mismatch or I'm done. Okay? Does that help? Okay. Any questions? Okay? So a try, how do we insert a new word into the try? Let's say there is a new word in English, uh, they. Let's say we want to insert they into the, into the try. How would we go about doing that? Walk down till we get to the dot, 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 eh. That eh is a nil pointer, right? We now build the part of a new node here to contain the y, right? And color it that way. Does everybody agree with it? So how much time should it take to insert a string of length s into the tree? Yes. S. Does everybody agree with that? You just walk down to the end, and it's deleted. It's done. Does everybody <laughs> see that? Any questions? How much time should it take? Can we delete something from the try? Let's think about that. How do we delete something from the try? OK, I decided that uh, I don't like the, the anymore. OK, how would I delete the from the try? If it's an internal node, I then would have to just change the color, right? Otherwise, I will walk to the end and delete things up to the, for the, the branching point. Does everybody agree with that? Because that's the stuff that has to stay. And that I argue again, what's the time of doing that? Order S, the length of the string. OK? So a try is a good thing. It lets us insert. It lets us search in as fast time as could possibly be done. OK? Again, the only thing that's, let's say, less magical about it is you say that it might take up a little more, more space by a constant factor, let's say, than maybe a more concise representation. Because I do have to carry around the baggage of these pointers, OK? But in principle, a try is a good thing. Any questions about tries and why they're a good thing? Right, so to decide whether, whether I can back up here, yeah. I can delete this node if and only if there is only one non-null pointer, right? Right, so checking that would take uh, Checking that would take time proportional to the alphabet size. Well, you yeah. could just keep it counter to number of I could keep a counter if I wanted, but, but what's the alphabet size? The alphabet size is, it's a constant, okay? If it was DNA, it's four. If it's English, it's... 26. If it's Chinese, well, then that's 50,000 or so, and that's not such a good thing. So for Chinese, it's not such a good thing. 
But if we're assuming that, that we have a character set that is a small constant, okay, which is true for, for most languages and most contexts, this is a good thing. Okay? Any questions about it? Yes? What's the difference between a try and a tree? What's the difference between a try and a tree? Okay? Here's where it would have been good to be able to flip back, which I can't do. Here, note that, let's look at the difference. Here, note that the annotations of here, the data are single letters, and they are happening at edges of the tree. Does everybody see that? In a binary search tree, which is probably what we were talking normally by a tree in computer science, you're probably more familiar with a binary search tree. There, what each node represented a string. This was mom. And it was, are you alphabetically before or after mom? Does that make sense? The annotation was at the node, okay, and it was a full string. So you had to do a comparison of your query string against this one to decide which half the tree, w the, 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 the element was on. Does that answer your question? Well, right, so I guess what I would say is each node in a tree, in a binary search tree, is an element in the dictionary. It's one of the things we might be searching for. In the try, it's the al elementary alphabet letters that compose the things that we're searching for. Okay, that's really what the difference here is. Okay? Okay, log good question. Where does the log end come from? If you think about a try, okay, a binary search tree, let's clear this out now, come, uh, monk. If we had a tree where we were representing all n words in our dictionary, how tall would that word, be, that tree be? If we think about it, if the tree was only one level, we could represent one word, right? If the tree was two levels, we could represent three words. If the tree was four levels, we could represent seven words. Does everybody see that as we add one more level to this, we double the number of words we can represent? Right? There's no room to fit more than seven words in a tree of three levels, right? So if you're going to fit an n, n words into this thing, you're going to have to double it, it log n times to get to n. Does that make sense? And that means that in order to, let's say the word you're looking for is at the bottom of the tree, it's a leaf. You'll have to do log n different comparisons until you get to the point where you found it. Okay, good questions. Any questions? Okay, any questions about a try or why it's a good thing? Yes? Okay, so there is now another question that you, another data structure you might have said, which is that maybe what I will do is to build a hash table. Okay, what would a hash table be? Okay, you're going to now build basically an array of maybe two n cells, right? You're going to take each string that you're given and compute a um, hash function on it, which is you know, is essentially a index into the array, and you put it there, okay? And the hope is that your hash function and your dictionary is such that you put each one of your words in a different place, okay? And then, how do you compute, look something up? To look up the word, you would, you want to look up a Skeena in there, you hash Skeena. That would give you an index into a, a part of the array. If there was nothing sitting there, Skeena wasn't in the dictionary. If there is something there, you have to explicitly check whether or not that thing is Skeena. It might have been something else that hashed to the same thing. That, if in, if in general, there's no re everything gets hashed to a unique place, that is also going to be order s time. 
You take the, the hash code, it takes S time to compute. You go to a spot in the array, that's constant time, you look it up, you do your thing. That's also order S. Okay? So the good thing is a hash table is good unless you get very, very unlucky and all the hash codes turn out to be the same and everybody gets piled into the same element on the array. Okay? So if you got unlucky with the hash codes, you couldn't guarantee that this is always, always, always going to take order S time in the worst case. That's one argument against the hash code. But hash tables are good things. I don't really want to beat on hash tables. I will tell you, though, that the idea of what I'm going to talk about afterwards, a suffix tray, is an extension of a try. Okay? And it's this extra, other, more powerful idea that gives you a lot of power you won't get in a, in a hash table. Okay? Any questions about it? Uh, yes? The hash table, the complexity of the space would be too much, right? You have to consider all possible combinations of 26 letters, probably. Well, okay, what is the space of a hash table? The truth is that when you compute a hash tape function, you mapping a hash function, we will talk about hash tape functions a little bit later here, but a hash function is a mapping between a string like Skeena and a number between 0 and n. Okay? And if I didn't have an upper bound on this, then it would be you know, infinitely big. But if I did something to, com to bound it, like in, a, in the range of the size of my array, I can set my hash function to work for whatever size array that I need it to work. Okay? And the hope is that if I leave enough holes in my array, but not too many, it will be both space efficient and there's not going to be a lot of collisions. And in general, that usually happens and hash tables are good things. But my goal is to teach you something that's better in some cases, okay, called the suffix tree. And that's going to be based on tries. Any questions? Any questions about hash tables, what these data structures is? The goal is to represent strings so we can search them. Okay? And there are lots of important solutions here. Okay, let's move on. Oops, now let's shrink this down. Come on. Uh, next, previous. Okay, now that we understand what a try is, I would like to show you a very, very special kind of a try. Okay? A try um, of suffixes. So what I'm going to do is my input here is one string. Okay? Not a, di not a dictionary, but one string. And I am going to, con let's say my string is of length n. I am going to construct n strings, okay, from that one string, okay, of the form of every single suffix possible of that string, right? The whole string is a suffix of itself. If I knock off the first character, I've got another suffix. Is that right? If I knock off the second character, first two characters, I get another suffix, right? In general, there are n possible sets of characters I can knock off to get a suffix. And each one of these strings is going to be of length between 1 and n, okay? And this is the set of suffixes of a string. Any questions by what I mean by the set of suffixes? Okay. I now took your n character string and I mapped it to n strings, each of which is of length between 1 and n. Okay. And now I can build a try on it. Does everybody agree on that? It's a set of strings. I can build a try on it. Okay. A try worked for any set of strings, right? Didn't have to be the words in English. Here are a set of strings. I claim I can build a try on it, okay? And that I am going to call a suffix try. Any questions about that? Okay? In principle, it sort of looks like this, okay? The suffix, if we look at it, let's zoom this thing up a little bit. Zoom. Okay, let's even zoom. 
Here is meant to be a sort of compressed suffix tree uh, version of it. Where is x, y, z, x, y, z? It's over here, right? X, y, z, x, y, z, right? Where is z, x, y, z? Z, x, y, z. Does everybody see that? Okay. Y, y, z, y, z, dollar sign. Does everybody agree with that? This is a try of all suffixes. Yes. Shouldn't there be one for which one? Y Z X Y Z dollar sign. I claim that I've got every single suffix here unless I made a mistake. Which one do you think I'm missing? Ah, the reason is because I didn't label this thing. If you look over here, you didn't see it, you didn't look carefully enough. Okay? <laughs> this label over here, this, this one didn't have a label. No, all suffixes are represented here. Every string is represented by a the leaf the nodes at the bottom, the leaf nodes, the terminal nodes, are what represents the suffix. Okay? And actually what we did here to make sure that they're leaf nodes, we did something kind of cute. Here was the string that you gave me. I added another letter of the alphabet that appeared nowhere else, an end of string marker. Does everybody agree with that? If I have an every the suffix ends with the end of string marker and it occurs nowhere else, I no longer have the the contained with their problem. Okay? Now it turns out that every um, node is going to, every suffix is going to be represented by a distinct leaf node in the tree. Any questions about that? Okay. Well, the only way you're going to stop here, you mean, what, how do I know the suffix? How do I know that I have to stop there in the first letter? Then I could have had another uh, letter that would have been the You want to say, how do I know X, Y, Z, X? Well, X, Y, Z, X. Where is X, Y, Z, X? X. If I walk down the tree, X, Y, Z, X. That's over here, right? That's not yet at a leaf node. What does that walk tell me? That walk tells me something interesting. It tells me that X, Y, Z, X is the prefix of some suffix. Okay? But it isn't a suffix in its end, because if so, it would go down to the bottom. Does everybody see that? A leaf node is one that has nothing coming out of it. Okay, yeah? Why don't you have dollars in all the... You should have them dollars here, okay? At the same place, you also can't see them because they're too small. <laughs> okay? You're right, okay? Any questions? Why did I put the last three suffixes? Only the last three suffixes in the first. What do you mean by the last? What, 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 what do you mean by the last three in the first level? I'm not. I'm not understanding. X, Y, Z, Y, Z, and Z. These are only three suffixes which are present in the first level. It's just because it was repeated. So okay. Because X, Y, Z. Right. So if you think about it, X, Y, Z happens to be, if you look at it, occurs twice in the string, right? There is a suffix that starts x, y, z. There is a suffix that's another suffix that starts x, y, z. Is that right? And there is nothing that starts x, y, something other than a z. If there was a suffix that started x, y, x, it would have split off from over here. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, this is kind of a short, concise form of the suffix tree. Does everybody see that? So I didn't write in all the nodes, okay? But I claim that this represents, given, you know, given the, the things you can't see, 
you know, the omissions from this thing. Given this, every suffix is represented. Any questions? Yeah, question. build it now is a, we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. One way you could build it is to just build it the way you built a, a try, right? This is a try of all suffixes. If you tell me how can I build it, well, a few minutes ago no one complained when I told you, how, when, when we discussed how to build a try of strings, right? You just one by one insert them in there. If you want to build a suffix tree, you could build it this way. Does everybody see that? Okay. Turns out there are clever ways to build it. But it should be clear that that would be a way to build it. Yes? Is there any significance of the numbers that you have made? Well, what are the numbers on the roots, on the leaf nodes? Yes, there is a significance. It is a significance is where did they start? Where was the position in the string of the suffix that it represents? Look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right? I claim that the leaf is telling me where in the string did I start. Here's five. What is the suffix for five? It's y, z, dollar sign, y, z, dollar sign. Does everybody see that? Okay. So that's what's interesting about how that's being represented there. Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions about what the suffix tree is and how we're representing it? Okay? Maybe question what good is it and all this kind of stuff. But it should be clear what it's here for. Now what's good for, what's it good for? Okay? Suppose I want to know whether I give you a query string. Let's say Z Y X. Z X Y. And I want to know, is ZXY in the string? Does it occur as a substring anywhere in the string? Could a, could a suffix tree help me here? Okay, why can it help me? Okay. Well, note that this is not a, a I'm not going to end up at a leaf. This is not a suffix. Right? But what do we know about any string that is a substring of the text? It is the prefix of some suffix. Okay? This may sound complicated, but it's not. Okay? Any string, if it's a substring in the text, has to be the prefix of a suffix. Why? That string starts someplace in the text. Okay? It continues for a certain number of characters. Therefore, it is at the prefix of that suffix. Does everybody agree with that? So how now do we reduce the problem of searching for a string? A string occurs within a query string. If it is a prefix of the suffix. Okay? So how do we now tell whether or not this is a substring of it? What would be the way to do it? Okay. Just go walk down the path. Oh, a Z node. The X node, the Y, ding, ding, ding. Okay. It is a prefix of a suffix. It is a substring of the string. Any questions about that? Yes. Forget the things in the brackets for a moment. We'll get to the things in brackets later. Okay. We don't need the things in the brackets yet. Any questions about that? Okay. So what is it? So, so does everybody see that suffix trees enable us to search? What's the time it takes to search if your a query string is a substring of the string? The length of the substring we're looking for, right? You take an arbitrarily long string. You want to say now, now this is interesting. Suppose you want to now know, let's say the human genome. Let's say I'd like to know if the, the, the string A, T, T, C, G, T, 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 T is a substring of the human genome. 
If I have the suffix three, which may be three, uh, of this thing, which is three billion bases long, okay, the time that it will take to search it is the length of the string, okay? So the suffix tree is an amazing thing. It enables us to search, is a string a substring of something? In time proportional to the size of it, of the search string, once we build the suffix tree. Any questions about that? Okay? So the suffix tree is a good thing, and I want to make sure everybody understands what a good thing it is. Okay, yes? <laughs> It is a try. It is a special try. It is a try of all the suffixes of a string. So in the try angle, we can find out whether a given string is a substring. No, in a try by itself, you cannot find whether all strings are a substring of one of the inputs. Let's go back. Okay. Uh, uh, kill. Shrink. Shrink. Back. Right. Here we've got our uh, zoom. What is he is a substring of there, right? How do you find he? You looking at the root. I can't see an H. No he. Okay. You can't search a try to find out is something a substring of one of the inputs. 